Hi, and welcome to a new week of this uh, study through the book of James. Uh, if you saw my post on Facebook yesterday, you will know that this is the third time I have tried to uh, record this particular devotional uh, and reflection. Uh, so I guess I have a little bit more preparation. Hopefully this will be the last time that I have to record this. Uh, so we'll, we'll pick up here again on uh, cha James chapter 2, uh, but we will, uh, let's open with prayer. Uh, loving God, uh, you have called us to not only believe certain things, but also to live uh, in a way that is honoring to you. Lord, uh, in our efforts to do both of those things, uh, Lord, throughout history, there have been people who have been tempted to let their good doctrine get in the way of their good practice. Lord, help us uh, to never be so blinded by making sure we get things right that we forget to live right. Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us as we, uh, as we reflect on this particular passage today. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um... We're going to pick up here on James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And, and starting at this point, we're going to see that James begins to uh, take longer periods of time to, to, to take several verses, five, six, seven verses, uh, to make one point. And so it, we're going to take a larger chunk of, of material. So this is what we read. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that the faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And, as the, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So this is a very interesting passage, and it's interesting not just now, but also throughout history, because um, for much of church history, and especially Protestant history, there's been an emphasis on the fact that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. And what makes it interesting is because if you do a phrase search throughout most of our English translations of the Bible, the only place you'll find the phrase faith alone is actually in this passage where James says that we are saved by works and not by faith alone. It's enough to make it make sense why Martin Luther did not care very much for the letter of James. In fact, he often, uh, he, he's credited for saying that uh, he wanted to uh, get the book of James out of the Bible. He called it an epistle of straw, and I can't help but think that it has to do uh, most especially with this particular passage where he stresses the importance of works and not of, uh, of mere faith. So it's interesting because John Wesley was, had strong sympathies with um, this idea that we're saved by faith alone, and yet he also had a strong emphasis on uh, the Christian life as lived out. And people would often point out a contradiction or, um, by saying, you know, St. Paul says that we're saved by faith, but St. James says we're saved by works. And Wesley's response was, we're talking about two different faiths. And we're talking about two different kinds of works. He said that Paul is talking about the faith that, uh, you know, the, the works that are no good for our salvation are the works that come before we have faith. And he says it's simply the believing, uh, whereas James is talking about the works that come after our faith. And, and so it's interesting the two examples they use, because Paul uses the example in Romans about um, Abraham who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then we have James who emphasizes this, this act of faith later on in the being willing to offer up his son Isaac. And, uh, that, but that's a, that's a work that's done after faith, not before it. Um, and also about the, the faith that we're talking about is two different things because Paul's talking about a faith that saves us, which is alive and transformative and helps us to be in Christ, whereas James is talking about a faith that does not manifest itself in your life, that, that has no implications for how we actually live our lives, and is therefore not a living faith, but a dead faith. So really, I think that Wesley does a good job of pointing out why um, when Paul says we're saved by faith and not by works, and when James says we're saved by our works and not by faith alone, they're talking about two different things. Because what Paul's trying to say is nothing we do earns our salvation, 
And James is saying a faith that doesn't change our life is not authentic faith. So, so that I think is important to realize. But James is clearly this, I wonder if this is part of what's really made him angry when he started writing this letter. And he was talking about um, you know, wishing someone well, saying somebody is cold and someone is hungry. And we say, boy, I hope you know, go, be well, be well fed, you know, be warm, but no action is taken to help. Then what good are those if there's words that aren't followed up by actions? I was reminded just the other day that I had uh, preached a sermon at a camp, a Christian camp, and I talked about prayer and this idea of like a Christian prayer is not Christian prayer if it stops when our mouths close and doesn't be get, get lived out in our actions. I think there's a lot of truth of that uh, that we see here in, in James as well. At the core of this teaching, though, and it's in the core of what we see in a lot of what Matthew de- uh, we find in Matthew when Jesus teaches, uh, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount, is that this idea of a faith that stays in our mind and doesn't manifest itself in life uh, isn't worth a whole lot. And, and sometimes we will hedge our bets and we'll try to say, well, yes, you know, uh, faith should manifest itself if we have an opportunity. And the only thing that worries me about that is I think that we have opportunity more often than we may realize. And the example that I often point to in the midst of all this is uh, the thief or the revolutionary who's crucified at the side of Jesus, who uh, receives Jesus. And I mean, he's literally actively dying and he has nowhere he can go because he's been nailed to the cross. So he's staying put. And in the midst of all that, uh, he still bears witness to what he believes about Jesus to the other thief or revolutionary. And um, so even that person who might be the paradigm case of someone who does not have opportunity for good works, there's a sense in which it is still changing his life. It is still impacting how he behaves toward other people. And to say that um, we we do good if we have opportunity and if we use it as an excuse to not do the good works that we do have opportunity for, uh, we may be missing some of the point. So one of the things that this gets me thinking about in the midst of all of this is what does it mean to do good, uh, to live out our faith in a time we can't have the same level of interaction with one another? And it also makes me think about um, were there times before we had to be separate where we were tempted to do this idea of, you know, I'm praying for you or I'm wishing you well, uh, but not necessarily putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And it makes me wonder, as we begin to be able to to open up our society again, as perhaps we can begin to uh, gather in groups again um, in the weeks and months to come, you know, is there, I would encourage you and myself to be aware of the little ways in which we get ourselves off the hook of having to live our faith by saying, well, I would have done good if I had an opportunity, uh, while at the same time ignoring the opportunities that come our way. So I think that James proves once again that he is one of the most hard-hitting, challenging books in the entire Bible. And uh, there's more to that to come, but uh, we'll, we'll come back again tomorrow and we'll reflect on a little more of the letter of James. Have a good day.